um, uh, well, so let's let's talk a little bit about the Great Green Wall project as a as a policy approach, and maybe first asking you whether you you based on what you know, what you've read, um, whether the projects that are that are shown they're sort of put on display here as examples of successes linked to this project of the Great Green Wall. Um, I think at some point they say it, fifteen percent of it is. Is has been at least undertaken 15% of the overall project of the 8,000 mile um, wall, or is it 8,000 kilometers? Kilometers, thank you. Um, so, were the projects that are highlighted in, in, in Ethiopia, Senegal, and elsewhere, did those come out of the Great Green Wall project, as far as you know, or is, is it more complicated think, than that? Well, the Ethiopia one clearly preceded it because. That farmer said that he started trying to bring the land back after the 1984 droughts. Um, and the Great Green Wall, I think, officially started in 2007 or 2008. Um, Senegal, it looks like that's being driven by something managed by the Great Green Wall project. Um, we both we have a mutual friend who has done a lot of work in Niger, in particular, with something called farmer managed natural regeneration, where they after the droughts of the 70s, um, realized that in places that had a little bit more tree cover, people didn't suffer as badly. And this idea of if we bring back the trees, we'll bring back the rains, although maybe not quite, there may not be quite the causal relationship there. Um, they, they were able to begin encouraging farmers to allow trees to grow up on their land. And then as they grow, they provide shade they provide fodder for animals when you can't grow other fodder. They help break up the soil. The soil is incredibly hard in the dry season. Um, so when it starts those torrential rains, if it's like a parking lot, it runs off somewhere else. So the trees kind of can slow the rain and help it soak into the soil. So there's this positive virtuous cycle there that started in the seventies, not in 2007. And so I think there are there are pockets that's being that are being driven by this and those are where you'd see the small trees but the the bigger older ones that we saw in some of the footage that preceded it but is i think it's designed to connect up a lot of these pre-existing efforts or they may not even be efforts they may just be places that still had trees so it's it's hard to be against planting trees, right? For goodness sake, <laughs> no one's going to say don't go out and plant trees. I planted trees in Peace Corps. I, you know, I worked with a local teacher. We got a bunch of little trees. We planted the seeds and replanted them around the village, and everyone felt good. And I think it was good. Um, I think there's there's a there's a big difference between planting large areas. Um, where actually there aren't really any people per se to manage and to actually, you know, this is the idea of farmer managed regeneration is that farmers are actually managing it. There's actually what we call social fencing going on. They're keeping, you know, there's corridors for the livestock. Um, if you don't establish some of these rules of the road, then basically, uh, you know, you're going to have the herders coming along, lopping off limbs so that the goats can get to the vegetation. Uh, you're going to have people cutting down willy nilly all the trees because of, um, you know, still most of the Sahel relies on firewood. There's also a massive charcoal production for urban centers, uh, which, um, you know, is denuding large, large areas. So you got a lot of forces, countervailing forces. Um, the, the premise behind the Great Green Wall, I think, is, is at, at the base, you know, good, and if they would support more of the farmer managed regeneration and, and channel more money towards that, I think it would be really helpful. But if you plant trees out in the middle of nowhere, I don't think they're going to survive for, for very long. And I don't really know, like the footage they had, I'm sure there were some successful pilots. Maybe they had fencing around it for all we know. It was a little hard to tell, like how they actually kept those trees alive and growing to the point they're probably not planted as john suggested in 2007 because they look a lot larger but you know who knows um so there's a lot of things that because i haven't been on the ground to see all of this i wouldn't be able to say for sure um, but i think that um my concern in part with this 
donors tend to hop on the next big thing, and this is a big thing, and I, I, it's generated out of Africa, so I think that's really important that it is being supported by policymakers in Africa. But there's also a lot of potential for graft, corruption, money being channeled to various not so good causes. And so we want to try to avoid that and actually fund the grassroots work that's actually helping. Okay, in just a moment, we're going to give you opportunities to ask a question or add a comment. There's a microphone over here. So if you could, if you have a question or you want to contribute something to the discussion, you could make your way there. I'll have an idea of how many people um, want to say something. So, so if you compare the Great Green Wall project to say more of an emphasis on farmer managed natural generation, what, you know, what, why have a Great Green Wall project? I mean, I guess you, you uh, talked about the interest of attracting large donors, but some, one of the persons interviewed in the, in the film said, well, you know, uh, there, there have also, there, there have always been large ambitious projects, the pyramids, the Great, the, you know, the Great Wall of China, if we are ambitious, it will mobilize people and get people excited and attract um, donors and so forth. So, um, so what are the advantages and disadvantages of having that kind of a scale project versus supporting more of the farmer generated um, regeneration, which seems to have had successes? Well, I think what was interesting about this and, and gave me some hope that it would succeed in a lot of places is that at least in the Senegal part they talked about how it is community driven and one of the risks that Alex was talking about was that. Uh, of a, a big sort of isolated forest that gets planted is that people will see it as a common resource and you get a tragedy of the commons where everybody goes to try to take it before somebody else takes it. Um, but if it's in communities, then they may be replicating the advantages of the farmer managed natural regeneration, where people do feel ownership, they want to take care of it. Uh, you know, if, if I think it's Alex's, I'm not going to cut it down for my animals, because he wouldn't like that. Um, so I think that was positive. What, well, I used to work at USAID. Donor agencies do like big projects. Groups like the African Union and the African Development Bank like big projects. You can tell there's a lot of pride in the idea of the biggest natural structure, I think they called it. And it's not a structure. It's a bunch of independent trees that are living near each other and mosaic together to make a wall. Um, and so I think what's kind of cool about it is that it is something that can be 100,000 individual projects where lots of different people go out and do their part and hopefully it will raise awareness that having more trees may you know they're wonderful I visited a friend of mine who was a volunteer a Peace Corps volunteer in eastern Niger in an incredibly hot dry place and when he got there he planted a tree and two years later it was almost big enough to kind of sit comfortably under and the village chief would come by and he was joking with me that Joseph, this friend of mine, this, you know, he planted this silly tree. How silly. We live in a desert. Why did he plant a tree? And I said, I don't know, but it's great because we're, we're sitting under it. And the chief kind of said, oh, yeah, you're right. And other people had started doing this. And so I think that if it gets some traction, I don't think it's gotten as much attention as people were hoping in 2007, 2008. But as people start to hear about it, it is a way that it's not building a pyramid where you need everybody working together. It's where people can work individually and sort of connect up a lot of individual efforts. And if it works, that would be awesome. And if it doesn't, it doesn't mean the whole thing fails. It means that in places it may not connect up. But hopefully on net, it'll be positive. Do you want to add to that? No, I mean, I agree with what John said. Uh, I think that, you know, as I said, there's inherently nothing negative about planting trees. I think it's on balance a good thing, and it will be a matter of time will tell whether the trees survive and, you know, as John said, connects uh, a larger ecosystem. Um, so I, I definitely, you know, think this would be a, a positive if it does succeed, and, and, um, and this kind of, you know, film will do a lot towards uh, promoting the idea, I think. So can I ask just a kind of a naive question about reforestation, 
regeneration. If, if you're in an area where trees and greenery isn't growing naturally and you introduce, you know, you come in and plant new trees, do they have to be irrigated and where do you come up with the water? And if not, you know, how, how do they, how do the trees take when there weren't trees there to begin with? I know that sounds like a really naive question, but um, just wondering how that yeah. works. I, I think in some cases there were there were trees on some of these landscapes, so I, I don't think they were necessarily all denuded. Um, I do think you need to water them in the first, you know, I, and I don't know how they go about doing that, to be honest. Um, again, it would take... Uh, sorry, um, there we go, right up to the lips. Um, so, <laughs> so it's... Um, it, I think it would take on the ground, like visiting a number of these sites to see how it's in, you know, the kind of, they're talking about billions of dollars. So, you know, they should have enough money there to water some trees and keep them going for a while. The question is what happens when the donor funding ends and, uh, you know, will those trees be sustained? I'll just add, um, you, you keep them alive the same way you do millet crops or maize or whatever you do have to go out and water it most all villages have to have a, a water source you know they have a well they'll pull water out of the well put it in pots and take it around and water once the trees take hold they should have a strong enough root system that they can get their own water and uh, you know they grow when it's the rainy season they kind of go dormant when it goes dry for eight or nine months um, with the farmer managed regeneration the thing that you have to do is just stop cutting down the trees. There was an, an incentive under French colonial rule that carried over into Nigerian independence that trees were seen as the property of the state. So if a farmer had a tree growing on his or her land and a forestry agent from the government came by and saw it, they might be told, you're responsible for that tree now. You can't let it die. So they have to spend their resources growing a tree that they can't touch rather than taking care of their crops. So what flipped in the 70s with the, the idea of letting farmers manage this as their own resource was they can take care of it. They're not going to be prevented from managing it for themselves. So they can pick the seed pods and use it for food. They can uh, use the leaves. The farmers benefit from it so they are no longer they no longer have this perverse incentive to make sure that the trees are not visible to a forestry agent because if it was visible before they had to take care of it for the state whereas now they take care of it for themselves and manage it in their own interest um and i think they said in senegal they're growing uh acacia senegalensis which is native in niger it's mostly uh, acacia albida um, or gum arabica. There's a couple of different, very dry tolerant trees that that they either allow to grow up or that they use um, when they introduce these um, nursery bread trees. Thank you. Um, does anyone have a question or comment? Okay, can you come down? Let me just ask one more question, uh, and then and then um, we'll let you ask a question just to follow up. Um, what, can you give us an idea of what percentage of people living in this region are farmers and you know are they smallholders are there examples of large more kind of industrial scale farms or are there a lot of people who are still herding like what's what does agriculture look like in that region um so it's mostly smallholder agriculture and um i think it varies by country but i would see but i would say it's probably somewhere by between 60 in 70 percent of the population maybe 80 percent in some countries are actually employed directly in agriculture or in pastoralism or agro pastoralism which is some combination of the two so that's those are the statistics um, and um, there are uh, larger plantation and irrigated uh, agricultural works in some regions uh, but they tend to be a employ a smaller much smaller percentage of the population and is it um, is some of that subsist subsistence farming, or is it partly subsistence and partly producing for the market? It's it's largely subsistence farming. Um, I mean, John may have other. I don't know if you have 
stats readily at hand, but uh, <laughs> um, it's largely subsistence agricultural production. But there's cotton. There's a cotton basin uh, in Mali or a peanut basin in in uh, in Senegal, and these do export. So there are localities where and then of course if you go farther south you start to get a cacao and you know things in the sudan Sahel um, savannah zone so it's 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 mixed and it's i wouldn't want to say across the board cashew is actually coming up in a lot of areas i've, I've heard you know it's in senegal it's growing a lot and it's an issue too because it, it depletes the water table and so um sustaining the population and and actually providing enough economic opportunities for the population i think is a real issue in the sahel mm -hmm. it's not something that we can just say you know <laughs> take lightly it's it's it, the, when you see the birth rates you see the population structure and you see the needs for economic growth it's it's a challenge and so that's that's real and it's there okay Hi, my name is Larissa. Can everyone hear me? Is it? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I have a comment slash question. I think like the first thing when um, you see like an area so arid, like the Sahel, you just ask yourself like, why are people living here? And same thing in like a US context with like New Orleans, you ask yourself, why are people living here if it keeps flooding? But like the reality is, is that these people have lived here for thousands of years. They're not unlivable to begin with but it was like colonization, capitalism, and exploitation that have deliberately made these places unlivable. So my question is, do you think that the documentary should have done a little bit more to talk about how developed countries have contributed to this climate change, how it's not just something that's like happening, um, especially given that those who are facing the consequences the most have contributed to climate change the least? I'll start. Um, yeah. I. I thought from the title that it was going to have a much more of a focus on climate climate change and what the the forest was going to do they chose to make it more about the singer who was touching on a whole bunch of different issues that all weave together um and i i've asked that question too i you know when i was living there i flew in and uh, air france used to have uh, cameras on the belly of the airplane and I flew in and it's just this red barren landscape and then you'll see some goats or some people and then you come into the capital. Um, it was the same time that the lander landed on Mars and the cover of Newsweek and The Economist and everything had pictures and I joked with my wife, you know, I, th I think they just got these magazine pictures from Air France. It's off the, it's the plane going into Niamey, it's not Mars. So I don't, I find it incredibly hard uh, it would be very hard. I, I wouldn't make it there. Um, and I wonder if part of the reason that people are eager to leave is that they're learning more about what's beyond, you know, as people have smartphones and so forth, and they learn that, oh, everything doesn't look like this, because even if this works, um, at least for a while, they're going to get off of the knife edge of poverty, but they're not going to be wealthy. They're still going to be subsistence farmers. They're just not going to be on the risk of, you know, on the edge of failure season after season. So, yes, I think it would it would have been a different movie, but I think it's important to understand that um, this place has been these places have been made worse off by exploitation. But they've also been left behind. So a lot of the differential, it's not that this is that much worse, but that a lot of other places have gotten a lot wealthier. And the, the governance, the technology, et cetera, the healthcare that have come into other places like Europe and North America and everywhere else haven't gotten there. And then that's driven by the, the issues that you're talking about. Um, I'll just pick up on this question of um, sort of to continue your line of thinking about people having lived there for a very long time. Um, another point that that you made earlier in a discussion, um, and there's a there's emphasis here on this. This is one of the regions that's 
not in that slide, but in the movie, um, that one of the regions that's most impacted by climate change, and that there's really a narrative of climate vulnerability. But can you talk a little bit about the way in which you can also think of this as a as a resilient region? Yeah. Um, so it is a highly climate exposed region i would say that means that the, there is a lot of um, risk associated with rainfall failure monsoon failure and uh, that is not the same thing as saying that it's it's vulnerable also because it's poor but the cultures that have lived there are highly resilient so how you balance that i'm not quite sure um, but you know i mentioned in an email to you that you had the Ghana Empire, the Mali Empire, the Songhai Empire, uh, from roughly 6th century AD to the, I think around the 14th or so centuries AD, that were massive empires. At one point it was rumored that Mansa Munsa, who was one of the kings of one of these empires, went to Cairo and spent so much gold that the price of gold just collapsed. Um, these were actually incredibly wealthy empires. Um, I won't, I don't, you know, I'm, colonialism was horrible across the board in Africa and neocolonialism and, you know, et cetera, is just as bad. And so I'm not going to be a champion for that. Um, and some of the blame undoubtedly, you know, lies at the feet of colonial uh, powers. Um, and clearly we also have this issue of, greenhouse gas emissions coming from the global north and disproportionately affecting those who are least able to withstand the impacts. Um, and this is a real issue. Um, it's an equity issue, a climate justice issue. Um, and they're not easily solved either. Uh, but, you know, reparations and other things are being talked about. Loss and damage, that whole narrative, that whole um, negotiation in the climate change context essentially comes down to who's going to pay for all this mess that's been created and the global north basically you know should be and you know re really by right should be on the hook to cover some of the costs but then finding the mechanisms and to do that in a way that actually promotes good governance and doesn't just flood regions with lots of money that then gets you know squandered or you know etc so there are a lot of issues that money alone will not solve. That's why I think some of these grassroots approaches and coming back to farmer managed natural regeneration and other things where you're actually trying to fund and get money to the very, you know, the very people who need it most. Um, I think that's one solution potentially. But I, coming back to your point, I think it's a very resilient region because they've had to live with these climate fluctuations for generations and generations. Uh, but there have been a lot of things that have come to pass that have caused them to become more at risk, I would say. Okay, well, maybe we will wrap up there. I, I just want to mention that the Climate School is, is a co-sponsor with the Maison Francaise of this film festival, so we're really grateful for that. Thank you so much to Alex and John for joining us. It's been a really interesting conversation that I think took the film as a starting point, but really taught us a lot more about, about this region and about the connections between climate change and the other kinds of issues that were raised. So thank you. Thanks to all of you for coming.